Uh, welcome. I'm State Senator Paul Pinsky, and thank you for uh, joining me this morning. We're going to try to be uh, efficient with our time. Um, I know you have a lot of other things to do today. If during the uh, conversation this morning um, you want to step in the back and get some of the free things we have, we have some maps. I know people have GPS, we have bike maps, we have some free recyclable shopping bags. Obviously, we have refreshments. We have some material on the purple line. Uh, so feel free to take any of uh, that information that uh, holds an interest for you. Um, before we start, I, I think we all realize that we're um, under a cloud this morning after the, uh, the horrible situation in Sandy Hook Elementary School last night or yesterday morning. Um, I have no great, grand words of wisdom. I think it hit not only us, but the whole country, probably internationally. Uh, the horrific situation, and it, we feel for the uh, parents and family members, all the people who uh, were killed and, and harmed. And obviously, the harm, besides the people who lost their lives, all those children are going to be affected, unfortunately. Um, and that makes for a very difficult time. Um, we're just going to take uh, 30 seconds of uh, quietude if you just have any thoughts for yourself. Um, so we'll just have a moment of silence uh, in memory of the, the whole community of Sandy Hook and particularly those families that lo lost loved ones. Thank you. Uh, this, today, this morning we're going to basically break up uh, today's presentation into three pieces. Um, we're going to have a, a section to hear from the, uh, from the county, from Brad Seaman, who's basically the chief operating officer for the county, about the initiatives of the county and what they're doing, and have some time for some questions. So that'll be a section on the county. Uh, I'm going to share some of uh, what happened last session, uh, the upcoming session, and my sense of what's happening in the county and the district on local issues. And then the third section, obviously, is to hear from you to allow you to have questions or comments. So it'll be approximately uh, 20 or 25 minutes of each section um, uh, to do that. You know, it's not too big a crowd, and, and I don't want to just introduce four or five elected officials, and we have a few, and they're important, they're my friends. Uh, but I think we're small enough, if we can do this very briefly, if you can just say your name and what town uh, you live in, just so we have a sense of who's with us today. Uh, I think it makes for a community. Maybe there's some uh, cross-fertilization. You'll meet someone you had heard about or wanted to talk to, or maybe even a neighbor, uh, and renew some friendships. So if we could, let's just go right down, and then we'll loop back around. It shouldn't take more than two or three minutes. Your name and your town. Welcome. Nice and loud. Name and town. Bob Quigg, our nine. Uh, Nick Orrick, uh, Riverdale. Richard Benoff, Lana. Tracy Dennison, we have a member of the town of Berwyn Heights. Chief Baird, Greenbelt. Penny Alcuaris, I work with Councilman Eric Polster, but I'm also a resident of Riverdale Park. Laverne. Dave Paul from Austin Community Relations out of St. George's County, the 311 
Folks, Purple Line want to... Roy Hamilton, I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Purple Line. Good morning, Terry Moss, I'm Strategic Outreach Coordinator for the Purple Line. Thank you for having me. Yep. I'm Brad Senior, you come short of county sheriff as well. Uh, thank you all, uh, thank you all. Hopefully uh, that uh, opens up some possibilities for people you might know. Um, we, we do have a number of elected officials, but Regular citizens are most important. That's why we do what we do to represent you. Uh, I do want to give um, uh, my colleague delegate and uh, board member, a, I want to give a, a quick shout out and a hello and give them a, a one minute to say hello and introduce themselves and, and share some things. Um, Tawani Gaines has been a delegate uh, serving with me from Berwyn Heights. Uh, Tawani, you want to, you can come up here or stay there, whatever. Okay.
election of the new superintendent. Last week, we, um, last week, this week, uh, the search committee, the search firm that has been hired came to the board and it's online and you can see it if you're interested, um, is the uh, characteristics that have been identified by all the uh, focus groups as well as over 1,500 online responses in terms of characteristics of people looking for. They were, uh, they said they've been doing this a long time and to get that much response from the community was really very impressive. And that uh, overwhelming majority of comments from the uh, online as well as from the focus groups were positive about what Prince George's County has to offer. We're gonna move very quickly on this. Um, they look to, they're gonna put the ads out. They've already received some applications in terms of the superintendent search and looks like um, end of February, beginning of March, we'll uh, start the interview process. We're hoping to conclude it by having the candidate identified in May so that by law, the superintendent starts as a superintendent in July. And why I'm being careful about that is they may come on board earlier, but they can't start as superintendent until July 1. Thank you. And I also have another event I've got to go to. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Um, we're going to, um, I think, start with my uh, assessment, uh, Brad, and then you want to follow me? Sure. Okay. And then we'll come back with uh, questions and uh, comments that you might have. We want to leave enough time. You want to raise an issue, I'll try to answer if I can. If I don't have the answer, we'll get back to you. That's, for those of you who have contacted our office, um, that's how we work. If we, if we have an answer, whether it's the right one or the wrong one, we'll tell you what it is. If we need to research information, uh, we'll get that information, get back to you, which, which I guess is a good segue. Um, let me start before we get into issues uh, with introducing my staff. Um, uh, Ian Allman in the back in the green shirt, some of you have dealt with, uh, is my uh, lead person on legislative uh, affairs and legislative director. And Kim Taylor over here on my right, your left, uh, is my outreach co uh, coordinator and community uh, operations person. Uh, fairly new to the staff, but not new to the community. Been active for a long, long time. And if you have questions or concerns, call my office. They will help you. I guarantee it. Uh, they're the ones that make me look good. Um, so I, I appreciate all their work, and you should call them for any kind of uh, information or assistance. We'll also have a couple of interns during the session, starting in January, who will be helping us in the office in Annapolis. And all of you are always welcome. If you want to come for a, a, a tour, you're either yourself or um, uh, community or church or, or school for a child or grandchild, we can help arrange those activities. You just need to call the office ahead of time. And even if it's for a quick hello, if you're in Annapolis for another reason, stop by our office, stop and say hello. If you've got to put your coat down or got to hop onto a computer for a quick minute, um, our office is there to help you. Um, also, in terms of details, um, if you, a child or a grandchild, is uh, interested in pursuing higher education, college, community college, four-year college in Maryland, and would like uh, some financial aid, there's some uh, senatorial scholarship money. Um, you can go online to get the application in about three weeks. You can download it, send it in, and uh, they have to be in by April. And by late May, generally, we'll have a decision and we try to spread that money to as many people as possible. We look at uh, need, we look at academic um, desire and a number of other factors. It's a very simple application. It's not one that takes many hours. So, uh, and it's for people of the 22nd district who plan to go to college in Maryland. So that's available as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, before I forget, because I probably will, uh, January 21st, we will have our eighth or ninth ninth uh, annual uh, legislative reception and recognition of Dr. King's uh, birthday, uh, January 21st in Annapolis from six to eight. Uh, we welcome all of you. Uh, there's a card in the back. You can RSVP by phone or by email. Uh, we like to keep track. It's, it's a nice dinner. Uh, we have some presentations and we honor Dr. King and also um, give an opportunity for you to meet the whole delegation and it's a pretty nice event. Um, it so happens this year it falls on the inauguration, which is usually January 20th. 
but because that's a Sunday, it's been pushed back to the 21st. So you can consider it your presidential inauguration ball. So you can come to the Annapolis, the Annapolis ball. You can party with the 22nd district. Uh, think of it. You know, it's a, it's dinner, a sit-down dinner for free. You know, so um, so uh, yeah, <laughs> and good food. Uh, catered by a local business. <laughs> and you can be home, get a good night's rest. And, uh, and there will be no hangover. Um, so anyway, we'd love to have you come up. It's a pretty nice event. So, uh, and there are going to be a couple of buses. I believe there'll be one from Greenbelt with the uh, Democratic um, uh, Club there, Roosevelt Club. And I believe there'll be one from Kingswood. There'll be a bus leaving from Kingswood. So if you don't want to drive, although it's a holiday, so parking is pretty easy that night. So there won't be much traffic, um, but there will be some transportation. Just call our office. Take a, there's a little um, postcard in the back. Take it as a reminder. We'd love to have you come up. OK, I think I have most of the, the details out, out of the way. <laughs> uh, let me cover a few issues. Um, we just finished an election. Uh, it's been six weeks. Um, I can't tell you how many people who have come up to me in the last six weeks and said, you know what, I'm proud to say I live in Maryland. They talk about watching CNN or NBC or ABC national news, not the local news, but national news. And they say, you know, they talked about Maryland. And they said that was pretty neat and it felt really good for me. And it's happened more and more. Now, I think we all, while our state and even our county has a few warts here and there and a few little problems, uh, we've made it our home. And we've chosen to make it our home. We see a lot of positive aspects to it, but now the whole nation is starting to see it. And obviously, one of the reasons for that uh, comes as a result of the election returns. Uh, the state became one of four, I believe, that uh, uh, endorsed by popular vote marriage equality, that everyone should be treated similarly, there should be no discrimination. We passed the DREAM Act. Um, while a number of states have had it, they haven't done it by popular election. We were one of the first to do that. Uh, obviously, we had an overwhelming, and I'm going to, uh, well, I can't help but be partisan. Um, we had overwhelming vote to reelect the President of the United States. And, um, and it's a lot to be proud of. And it's because of people like you. Uh, there are parts of the state that didn't vote similarly. But as you know, it's a total macro vote of the state. And the 22nd district was stunning in, in their turnout and their consciousness and how they decided to cast uh, a vote that reflects their feelings. So I, I think it's very positive. Uh, look, are there people who disagree? Yes, and I respect those who disagree. Um, at the end of the day, we debate public policy. And it comes to a popular vote in the legislature and, and to the citizenry. And then we all get in line behind that viewpoint. I think uh, society is changing. It's about education. You know, we're lifetime learners. You know, learning doesn't stop at 12th grade or with college. We're all learning, we're all changing. I'm changing, you're changing. You know, we might have been somewhere two years ago. Uh, two years later, we say, you know what? Maybe this is the right thing to do. So I, I, I think it is uh, an example of us learning, us teaching, and hopefully there'll be some lessons for other states and we can be a leader in teaching them about uh, justice and equality and, um, and these kind of opportunities. Uh, not to go back over it, but the DREAM Act, and I happened to be the floor leader in the, in the Maryland Senate on this issue two years ago, you know, we heard a bit from 11th and 12th graders who were sitting at Northwestern High School, Parkdale High School, came before our committee, who were taking AP class, advanced placement classes, who were getting A's, who were very driven, but at the end of the day, they couldn't afford to go to the University of Maryland College Park, which was five minutes away from their home. They were here through no fault of their own, their family had paid their bills, actually had paid taxes. It's odd, you say, well, they're not citizens, how can they pay taxes? IRS doesn't care. They'll take anybody's money. 
So you had people who were paying taxes, contributing, but yet they had to pay out-of-state tuition $25,000, dollars $27,000, which basically prohibited them, blocked them from going to a place like uh, College Park uh, or, or Morgan State or Bowie State or wherever in the state. And the idea that there's something at the end of the rainbow, there's a dream that they can be successful opposed to being limited to working at a McDonald's uh, was very, very important. And I think the capacity to care for others and take the big picture view was really reflective and important, I think, for Maryland. And, um, and the same holds true, obviously, with marriage equality. So I think it was great. Uh, it'll probably come up in a moment uh, when we have questions. We've had the discussion about ga uh, gaming and gambling. Uh, as many of you know, uh, I have never been a, a big fan of raising revenue from gambling, uh, and I personally voted no. Uh, I also understood that the genie was out of the bottle, that we passed uh, gambling a couple of years ago, and probably the site at National Harbor would have been the best one in the state anyway. So I understood the economic development issue here. So while I opposed it, I was very understanding of the need to move forward. If it's going to happen, why not have the county have some advantage economically? Um, so that issue was passed, it's done, and we move forward on that. In um, about uh, 28 days or so, um, we will reconvene in the Annapolis um, uh, chamber, uh, Merlin Senate and, and the House of Delegates chamber. It meets 90 days every year. And as I've shared with some of you who've been to these before, um, they say, why do you meet for 90 days and why in the winter? Well, if you go back 200 years, the people who went up to Annapolis to cast the votes and make law were farmers. And raising their crops was more important than passing laws. So the only time they went up to the capital was when it was frozen and cold and they couldn't grow crops. So they went up in the winter when they couldn't do anything anyway. And that has essentially remained. There are some states that meet year round, California, New York. There's some that meet every two years. There are a couple that meet only when the governor wants them. And that's not too frequent because most governors don't want the legislature. Uh, but we meet for 90 days. We go in the second Wednesday of January every year and meet for 90 days, except when we have special sessions. And last year we had two of those. And hopefully that doesn't happen for a long, long time. Uh, issues coming up. Let, let me start. Uh, Tawana Gaines uh, raised the issue of, um, of transportation. But before I do that, we've been joined by uh, the newest delegate uh, to the 22nd District. As some of you have, have read, um, Justin Ross uh, resigned uh, about a month ago to pursue other business options. Um, he did leave in midterm, so that meant the governor had to appoint a replacement. Uh, that replacement is someone who's been active and worked in the, uh, in the jurisdiction, in the community, lives in Hyattsville, has worked for a council member, Will Campos, and that's Alonzo Washington. Alonzo, you want to stand and welcome Alonzo Washington? <laughs> And uh, I think they timed this. Um, the third delegate, each district has one center and three delegates. Uh, the third district is Ann Healy, also of Myatville, has just joined us. Ann Healy is in the house. Yeah. So uh, b back to the upcoming period of time. Um, Tawana raised the issue of transportation. You all have driven our roads, and the replacement and the repairs are coming a lot more slowly. Now, we've had a few repairs recently. Uh, it's great. Um, some of the roads that have had some major problems have been repaired. They were in the queue, in the line, going back two or three or four years. But since the recession particularly, um, road repairs have been a problem, bridge repairs, et cetera. There is a fund, the Transportation Trust Fund, that used to be fairly large, and we put money there, and that would be used to repair roads or build new ones that has been decimated during the re recession, and that is close to zero. So besides the need to repair existing roads, we have a major project, and that's the Purple Line, that's on the books. And we have applied to the federal government for aid, and for those of you not familiar with the Purple Line, you want to get a moment and pull a brochure from the folks in the back, you know, all the spokes of the metro go out from Washington like spokes on a wheel. But for those of you who have to travel to, let's say, Wheaton 
or Rockville, it means going to the middle of the wheel and back out again, and it takes a lot of time and it doesn't make sense. And the idea of having an outer ring that connects the spokes, where you don't have to go in and back out, has long been an interest of many folks. Also, to get people out of their cars to try to reduce the carbon, you know, at, at, uh, and uh, climate changing uh, contributions to the air, which is, is debilitating our, our, our world, not just our country, with, with um, sea level rise. The idea of getting people out of the cars, expanding mass transit, and connecting the spokes has long, long been on the uh, agenda. I've been working on this for about 20 years. And the plan, as most of you know, to go from New Carrollton to Bethesda, east-west, to try to get people off the beltway, out of their cars, you know, moving people who either work in one area and live in the other, either live in Prince George's and work in the Bethesda, Silver Spring area, or vice versa, uh, has been a long goal. It's very expensive, about $2 billion. We have put into the federal government for funds, and we are near the top of the queue. They said our project is worthwhile, particularly because there are a lot of federal employees who have to get to work. The problem is they will pay half. That means they will front a billion dollars. The state has to come up with the other billion. So this transportation trust fund, uh, which is near nil, needs money for its own road repairs and also for new projects like Purple Line. And if we can't come up with additional money from the Purple Line to get the match, unfortunately, it's not going to happen. Now, I don't want to start off this morning talking about raising taxes, because um, usually, uh, and most of you know, I believe, things like income tax, income tax and corporate tax, we ought to put the tax on those that can better afford it, the millionaires and billionaires who I think get off scot-free. Uh, and, and the burden shouldn't be on working middle-income people. But there's a view that if you're going to raise money for transportation, it ought to come from transportation. And that means a, a gas tax of adding a few pennies. So that will be on the agenda. We think there are some trepidation. There are some people who say, look, we don't want to raise taxes. We're not out of the recession yet. So that issue, it's unclear how that's going to go. Is the governor going to be out in front of it? We don't know. Will the, the president of the Senate, Speaker of the House, be out in front of it? Those discussions are taking place. But that will be an issue that will swirl around, and it has implications for us, both on paying and also receiving the benefits. You know, a lot of people say government's too big, they spend money, uh, sometimes unwisely. Uh, but government plays a role to have a productive society so people can get to work. So think about it. I'm not here to say you have to do it and this is how much you have to pay, uh, but we want you to think about whether cost-benefit analysis. Is having better roads, the purple line, worth it? A couple of other issues. <laughs> I, I mentioned energy, um, carbon dioxide and, and carbon monoxide and, and methane and, and a lot of things, uh, many of which, uh, and not get into a science lesson, contribute to global warming. It gets, it gets uh, blocked. It doesn't leave the atmosphere. It raises the temperature. It melts ice. Greenland ice cap uh, and uh, Arctic ice. And it's unbelievable that the so-called melting of these blocks could raise sea level inches or even feet. And as we know, Maryland has a coast. It has a bay with tidal waters. And there are four states that are, would be the most uh, hit the worst if we had sea level rise of six inches or eight inches or 10 inches. And we just saw what happened with Hurricane Sandy in New York. You know, you, you all saw the pictures down at the, um, uh, the southern end, the southern tip. I can't remember what that park's called. Battery park. I'm sorry? Battery park. Battery park. You saw the water coming over the edge with a storm surge. Well, if you had sea level rise plus a storm surge, there would have been even more damage. If you think about it, you have Florida, you have Louisiana, you have Maryland, and there's one other that fits in the same category that would see the most damage. You, know, you think about Baltimore, you think about Annapolis, 
and then you can go up the coast. Philadelphia, Boston, New York. This issue is not just an environmental issue. This is an economic issue. I mean, companies that want to build five years from now and build a high-rise office building in one of these cities have to decide, is it safe? You know, we've been promoting this issue for a number of years. I was the lead sponsor of the Global Warming Solutions Act about four years ago, which for Maryland said we have to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2020. We became one of three states to do that. And we got a lot of pushback. They said, oh, it's just uh, tree huggers. We have a lot of farmers in the Eastern Shore who are at ground level, who are zero feet above sea level. It's their future, it's their economy, it's their livelihood. Ocean City, you know, a big tourist destination. A lot of money is spent there. You have sea level rise, that is a major, major problem. So we're going to try to do what we can do in Maryland. Um, and one of the uh, proposals to get away from using a lot of coal, which is one of the most harmful for the environment, is to start using clean, sustainable energy. And one proposal is to have offshore wind turbines. We have to reach a certain level of clean, sustainable power, solar, wind, and some other new technologies, um, geothermal, which is underground pipes, uh, to use the uh, 55 degrees of the ground to either heat or cool large buildings. And a number of us have proposed having these offshore wind turbines about 10 or 11 miles off the coast of Ocean City. They would barely be visible. They'd look like toothpicks. And for the last two years, we've tried and tried to get this bill passed. The governor has, has put his full weight, and we've fallen one vote short on a key committee. Uh, we're going to try again. Uh, we're going to get that six vote one way or another. Uh, to get that project started. The federal government has given the go-ahead for us to pursue it. They've mapped it. Uh, I believe it could create enough energy, depending on how many turbines, to um, provide electric for 110,000 homes. That's uh, 400,000 people on the, on the Eastern Shore. And that's just the beginning. Because if Massachusetts and Rhode Island who, and New Jersey, who are, also have plans on the books, can start to provide it, the next step is to connect them with a spine of power cords where if a certain area on the East Coast needs to power, it can come from Massachusetts and Rhode Island down to Virginia or from Maryland up to New Jersey. And actually one company, a small company that we're pretty familiar with, Google, is interested in potentially building a superhighway of energy along the coast, underground, offshore, that would connect these um, wind turbines that would be promoted by different states. So the uh, offshore wind is going to be another issue that we're going to be addressing, hopefully this session, uh, hopefully successfully. And I'm going to mention one other issue on uh, energy. Um, coal energy has now been replaced as um, a major uh, uh, contributor to creating electricity with uh, natural gas. Natural gas prices has gone, have gone down pretty significantly. And there have been pockets of natural gas all over the country for years, but in the last 10 or 15 years, they found a new source of natural gas under the ground, um, particularly in some parts of the country like Pennsylvania. And it's a new kind of, it's a kind of shale that they hadn't used before. It's called Marcellus Shale, at least in, in our area. And it's a, it's, a, it's a vein where they can tap for uh, natural gas. They also have some in New York. It, there's a large sector along the East Coast inland. And there's a piece of it in Western Maryland, Garrett County, actually. The problem is some of these companies are in a very quick hurry to get this natural gas because they can make a lot of money and it's, uh, it is cheaper than oil. The problem is the te technology they're using is somewhat unproven. What they do, they, they, they build these shafts down and then they have another horizontal shaft 
and they mix chemicals, some of which are carcinogenics, with high-powered water. I mean, when I say high-powered, I meant that would not only knock you down, it might kill you. I mean, very high-powered to break the shale underground to release this gas. The problem with all that water with those chemicals and unknown things that come out when the, when the rock, the shale is cracked and broken, that water eventually has to come back up to the ground, into the water table. Some of it is removed, some just naturally comes up, and if there's a well or a pond, it also seeps into it. And there's a question of people's health and safety. The governor of New York about two years ago uh, had a moratorium. He said, I don't, I'm not sure about this. And they stopped it in New York. Uh, our governor has joined in with that, uh, asking for a study. The, the company that wants to get into the thing called fracking, fracturing, it, it's called fracturing, but for short, shorthand they call it fracking, um, wants to get going on a quick pace. So that issue is another issue. And while we're not in Western Maryland, we're not in Garrett County, they could be harmed, and we can't, I don't believe we can move forward unless it's proven beyond a shadow of doubt to be safe. So that's another issue. Um, in terms of, you know, except for the transportation, we, we dealt with taxes, we raised income tax on, on the highest uh, earners last year. I don't think there's going to be a big issue on taxes that are going to affect us. Um, in some ways, a lot of people want to take a break after the last year or two of a very difficult session. So there's not a long list of key issues I can tell you are going to be front and center on people's mind. We obviously want to retain uh, the formula for school funding so our county can be funded and our schools can run. Uh, there is one issue that I, I have been working on for a number of years. We have a lot of large corporations that play games with the tax system, the corporate tax system. And what they do is they set up subsidiaries and they incorporate in Delaware or North Dakota. And what should be a business ex expense for them, or even a profit center, they attribute to some other company. So let's take someone like Walmart. Even though Walmart owns all the property, all the goods, and makes all the profit, they will create a new company like Walmart Blue. And they're going to take all ownership of all their stores and incorporate a new company in Delaware. So when Walmart in Maryland starts to do their taxes, they say, well, you know what? We have to pay rent to Walmart Blue. And they reduce their taxable income. And their HR department, their, their human resources department, they incorporate into a separate company and they subcontract with Walmart Red, who's in North Dakota. And then when they're working their books to figure out their pay, well, you know, we had to pay our, an HR company. And they reduce their bottom line even more because their business expenses. At the end of the day, believe it or not, and I can't say it's Walmart, but there are about 12 companies, large international companies working in Maryland that paid zero corporate income tax. Because at the end of the day, all these expenses leave them with no profit. But as you know, they're part of the big company at the top, and all the subsidiaries are still part of one company. And they game the system, as it were. Now, I don't know if it's um, Rite Aid, I don't know if it's Bank of America, because it's proprietary information. You, you can't find that. Just as your tax returns are private, we don't know them. But we have a list of 25 or 30, and we know 10 or 12 of them paid zero taxes. If you have a small business, I see Pete Sparopoulos here. Uh, if you have a small business, you don't incorporate in 10 states and have four CPAs. You can't afford it. If you are a little company and you've got um, uh, a software company of you, your spouse, and maybe a, a brother-in-law or sister-in-law, you pay taxes. Every small and medium-sized business pays taxes. The people who don't are the big folks who have a whole floor of lawyers and accountants who figure out how to game the system. So I have a, a bill we came one vote short in the Senate uh, committee last year called Combined Reporting uh, to try to address that. It would bring in between 100 and $150 million a year. 
that they are avoiding pain. So these are some state issues that are before us. Uh, I've gone on way too long. Um, local issues, I mentioned Purple Line, the school search Peggy talked about. We need a great superintendent. We need to move the dynamism forward. A lot of things are happening in our district. There's a lot of energy and vitality. I talk about Route 1, obviously bus boys and Franklins that just celebrated their 20th anniversary. Um, more housing going up and we're hope, hoping to spread that to the rest of the district. Every area won't move forward at the same time, but we can all benefit from where there is energy and vitality to other areas, to Riverdale, to New Carrollton, to Lanning, and that's really on our agenda. Uh, you heard about the hospital. We do need a, a new dynamic regional hospital. The likelihood is it will be somewhere along the Beltway, and the University of Maryland uh, medical system will run it. So uh, they have a lot of experience, and hopefully it'll bring more people back to the county to use our health care. As many of you know, and many of you might do, more people are going to the hospital center and Arundel Hospital or to Hopkins or elsewhere, Sibley, whatever, uh, and not using our hospital. And what that means, you have a smaller portion of the clients have private insurance, and a larger number are, are uninsured, what's called uncompensated care. We need to change that mix where there are more private payers, more of the middle class of the county, are using our local hospital where we can have a great uh, staff, people from the University of Maryland, possibly a teaching hospital, where it becomes a real jewel for the county. Let me stop there. We're going to hold questions. Uh, I went on much too long. At this point, I want to bring up Brad Seaman. Uh, Brad is the right hand uh, man or left hand, whatever, of our, our friend and neighbor, uh, Rashern Baker. And we asked Brad to come and talk about some of the initiatives and some of the efforts they're making to try to have our county run more smoothly, uh, be more um, consumer. Uh, responsive to you, and uh, I'm going to pass it on to Brad Seaman, a really terrific guy. Brad, it's all yours. You. you can either take it, you can take it off or you um, I'll, I'll take it off. Okay. okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Senator Penske, uh, for inviting me out to, to speak with you this morning. Um, I always consider it a privilege to go uh, and speak to residents of Prince George's County to let them know uh, what we're doing and more importantly answer questions that you have. Uh, hopefully with this county executive what you felt uh, is a willingness to listen to the difficult uh, and tough issues uh, to be honest with you about um, what he wants to do and why he wants to do it um, and also uh, take into account uh, the things that you say and how they, um, and the concerns you have and how it helps to shape uh, the things that we're trying to do here in Prince George's County. So I think, um, you know, I talk a lot, so I wanna be respectful of um, the Senator's town hall and, uh, and the time. So I brought a, um, a visual aid with me that I think will kind of help to tie everything together and allow me to cover multiple things at one time and then, of course, um, as the senator said, uh, open to answer questions. I, the other thing I'd like to say is that um, from my perspective, and I'm chief administrative officer, I report directly to the county executive. Technically, the rest of the government reports to me. Um, but I have four deputy chief administrative officers uh, that cover public safety, um, economic development, health and human services, and finance and administration. And uh, they do a lion's share of the work. We, we do have two assistant deputy chief administrative officers as well, and the department directors around the government uh, report to the four uh, chief uh, deputies in, other than the Office of Law, the Office of Information Technology, um, both, uh, and Human Resources. Uh, all three of those report to me. Um, so that's a little bit about the way that we're structured. Um, what you have here on my left, and hopefully you can see it, uh, is what we're calling the Baker Strategic Economic Development Model. And what it should show you is that, is how everything ties together with respect to some of the programs and initiatives that, that we have going in uh, the county government. 
and how and why we're doing them and how they relate to overall economic development in the county and in how economic development ties into being able to improve uh, the quality of life for, uh, for the residents in the county. The, the circle here on the far right, and can you all see this? Because I actually have some hard copies I could pass around. Let me do that. So everybody won't get one, but we probably need to tend it towards this side of the room since, that's, since they're the furthest away. But um, let me say this as, as they're passing that out. To a large extent, what, uh, what Mr. Baker believes is that um, all things work together. Education, public safety, economic development, all work together holistically to improve the quality of life for the residents in the county. And we have started a number of projects to cut across those areas, some controversial, some not. Um, some of them you agree with, some of them you probably don't. But it's our job to tell you why we're doing these things so that you can you know, let us know what you think. Um, in the far, uh, to your far right over there, um, that circle talks about uh, resources and funding. So that's actually pretty easy. We get an annual budget, uh, which is about $2.7 billion a year. We have about $300 million in grants that we get from federal and other sources, which add up to about a $3 billion a year government that uh, you have at the county level. Um, we also get federal funds from uh, home, program, uh, CDBG, Community Development Block Grant, um, and other competitive grants that uh, exist around the county. We also have partnerships, and I can talk with that a little bit, about that a little bit more, but some, as, as the, the profile of the county has gone up, um, Mr. Baker is liked by many. Uh, we've gotten a lot of offers of assistance, and those things continue to expand. It's probably one of the more exciting things uh, about what we're doing now, and I can elaborate on that as we go through. But, and then there are incentive programs. Many uh, come from uh, the state, from the Department of Business and Economic Development, has incentive programs. And then the last thing I have here is HEZ, which is sort of like, I'm hoping that this happens, but Health Enterprise Zone program uh, that was started, I think it was championed by Lieutenant Governor Brown, and they are, we have applied for uh, grant funding to designate a Health Enterprise Zone within the county, I believe it's in the Capitol Heights area. We've asked for $7 million uh, over a four year period uh, in order to attract um, primary care physicians into the county as we prepare for the regional medical center. We're about 61 primary care physicians short of what the uh, Federal Department of um, uh, uh, HRSA, um, I can't remember the name right now, but it's, the, it's HRSA, and they designate that there should be like one physician per every two or 3,000 residents, and we're short of that. And so we need incentive programs to have people, loan repayment programs, uh, tax breaks and what have you to get primary care physicians to locate here in the county. So um, we made the first cut on the HEZ and uh, we hope that, that we'll be selected um, as one to bring additional resources. And I should also mention that for the first time, the, our health department won a $2.6 million competitive grant from the Federal Centers for Disease Control uh, for community transformation. So um, we are improving our ability to bring in funds uh, from, from other sources uh, besides your, uh, your, your county and state tax dollars. Um, but as we get that, those resources and funding, and then we start different programs, our Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative, which uh, hopefully many of you have heard about that by now. It's probably, it is the signature program of the county executive because again, it takes a holistic approach to improving the quality of life in the county. I'll briefly say about the TNI, there are six areas we're actually, which are actually on this map that are here. Um, Langley Park, East Riverdale, Bladensburg, uh, Kentland Palmer Park, 
Suitland, Hillcrest Heights, and Glass Manor, Oxen Hill that we have chosen as six areas to focus our county resources in. I mentioned we have four deputy chief administrative officers and two assistants, happens to be six, got lucky on that. We put one of them in charge of each of the areas. We also have put fixed teams in those areas to cut across the executive branch of government as well as uh, the sheriff, uh, the Prince George's County Public Schools, and uh, they, they meet once or twice a month within the six areas. Uh, they uh, reach out to the, they reached out to the community from the beginning to find out what the community thought the issues were. Largely, the issues were around um, uh, public safety, youth, uh, transportation, um, and blight-related issues, vacant and abandoned homes and what have you. Um, we took the input that we got from the community, developed a plan, and then we went out into those six areas uh, and we're doing work in those areas, working on roads, asking the state for more money, more help there. Uh, we chose the six areas based on nine indicators that included violent crime, property crime, um, concentrations of Section 8 housing, third and fifth grade reading and math scores, income levels, pedestrian injuries and deaths, uh, and foreclosures to cover most of them, and uh, school absentee rates. Uh, we didn't have any health measures in there, not because we didn't want it, but we couldn't get a hold of the data from DHMH in an electronic format, but what they did give us was a map. I didn't bring that map with me, um, but if you look at the map of the uh, elevated health indicators, um, you know, um, uh, low birth weight, uh, and things of that nature, chronic disease related. If you overlay that map uh, over the map, the TNI map that we have, you'll see that many of the issue, the health related issues are concentrated in the six areas that I just named. Um, many of you, with respect to TNI, many, some of you are probably thinking, well, what happens to the rest of the county when we focus the resources in those six areas? Well, great things happen because we figure out what's broken in terms of our county processes and systems by working more closely in those six areas and then we fix those systems and it benefits the entire county and I'll give you a good example of that uh, in a moment. But what, the, what have been the results of the TNI? Well, um, I don't think this is wood but I'll knock on it. Um, we will announce next week, week uh, record drops in violent and property crime in Prince George's County we are back to 1980 levels with respect to those. Um, we have a double digit reduction that is way, 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 way above the national average with respect to um, homicide rates. Every crime indicator in the county, every crime, in, I'm sorry, thank you, Paul. Um, every crime indicator in the county is down um, and we really expect that to help with the economic development in the county and I will um, explain a little bit more why in a minute. But So we have our EDI fund with $50 million fund that the county executive um, work with the county council to put in place um, a year and a half or so ago. We have made six uh, investments or loans to uh, companies around the county. We've retained and created jobs with those investments. Um, I see every application. I'm the final signature on it. Um, I'm a certified public accountant by training. Uh, I ran a business over here in Greenbelt and my wife still runs it and owns it. Um, that, um, and, and so I'm a businessman by nature. So I know what I'm looking at when I look at numbers. I've rejected some of the applications. If um, I think it's a poor risk, and we do take some risk, but it's poor risk of taxpayer dollars because there's not enough return on investment with respect to job creation or job retention, then I will reject it and I have done that. Um, the PHIS is a public health impact study that was done by the University of Maryland uh, School of Public Health in conjunction with the partnership we have with the University of Maryland Medical System, which I'll call UMS from now on, and the state to build the regional medical center. That is how we identified that we are short 61 primary care uh, physicians here in the county. County executive began an education commission uh, that is going to work collaboratively with, uh, with the school board and uh, the superintendent 
to offer ways that the county may be able to help um, in partnership with the board and the system to improve the level of education here within the county. Um, I know that education is near and dear to the senator's heart and many of you. Um, I always take the opportunity because I've done a little research myself to say that um, you know our school system uh, does get a hard time from a lot of places. But as I've said a number of times, you know Maryland is the, for the fourth year running is the number one state in the country for public education. Now, while Prince George's County Public Schools, according to somebody's rankings, may rank 23 out of 24 jurisdictions, it nevertheless is in the number one state in the country. And were it not for the consistent uh, improvements in test scores from 2004 through 2011, at least for the last, <coughs> excuse me, two years, we would not have been able to maintain that ranking. Um, one other little statistic I'll throw out to you that I found that when I say it most of the time people don't know. Um, there's an after school math enrichment program. It's an, I, it at least covers the eastern half of the nation. It has over a million students in it. Um, and um, Prince George's County in the last round, <coughs> excuse me, had <coughs> the number three student in the nation the number 35 student in the nation and the number 76 student in the nation in this program of over 1 million. So while we have work to do, uh, and we always have work to do, um, I think that what we need to do in order to also get people to understand that education and public safety are not reasons to move your business in or your residents into the county, we need to talk about the things that are good uh, while we're working hard to improve the things that, that can get better. Um, so the county executive's um, education commission is doing that. And there's some other things here as well. The only other thing I'll mention is we have implemented a 311 number that you can call in, non-emergency number that you can call into, um, and and also have an an online uh, app application that works on Android phones and um, iPhones, where if you see something that's wrong, you can either call call in. Um, or you can take a picture of it or type it in uh, on your phone after you pull over to the side of the road um, and send it in and it goes straight to our departments and then we track um, how those things get resolved. Um, so that's probably one of the better things that we've done for convenience for the citizens. So if we get these two circles working real well and get them turning with high performance government, and when I say high performance government, we have a county stat program that we've used to, to, to measure things and make some improvements. Um, we also are implementing the use of a data warehouse. Probably one of the more important initiatives to date is the uh, creation of a department of permitting inspections and enforcement. Uh, currently, our permitting functions, Prince George's County has a reputation for three things that aren't good. Public safety, education, and difficult to do business with. And we have to either fix those things or tell the real story about it. Not, we have to do both. Um, with respect to doing business with us, it's hard to get a permit. You have to know somebody to get through. Um, we need to deal with that. One of the challenges is that our Department of Environmental Resources has a mixed mission. It has a sustainability mission and it has a development mission that are mixed into one department. Both of them are important. They need to be separate. So we are splitting up the Department of Environmental Resources and taking the permitting inspections and enforcement functions from that, putting it into a separate department, pulling some of the similar functions from the Department of Public Works and Transportation into the new department. Same thing with the inspections that happen from our health department, fire. We're detailing people from the Soil Conservation District, people from park and planning, and they will sit in one place and make it so that you don't have to bounce all over the county to get your questions answered with respect to getting permits, whether it be for a project at your home or something uh, you know, larger like a development. And so, and we're making other process improvements in terms of HR. Uh, we're working to get the right people on the bus, the right people off, and the, the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and the right people in the right seats. We made a lot of progress there. So as you get those three circles turning at the top, you get real and perceived improvements in the county. Again, I talked about 
uh, the, the, the crime reduction that we have, um, safer neighborhoods, better schools, um, and positive press. So when the paper writes about us and people read, they read things that make them want to come to Prince George's County. That gets into asset creation. We have several assets that we're creating already. Uh, the regional medical center that the senator talked about, um, although it's controversial, it's a $40 million a year revenue producer, a, a destination resort facility at um, National Harbor, hopefully. And then I'll close out by transit-oriented development. Regardless of what you hear, um, this administration believes in TOD. Um, we will put our money and our efforts where our mouth is. Um, we are looking at a number of different sites for the regional medical center. Uh, we will be coming to the public for input. Some of those sites are transit oriented. We understand how important that is. And we're looking at doing other projects around uh, transit stations as well. And we, and th what I'll say about that um, is that We've had probably a, not the best strategy in the world for attracting a federal building to a transit uh, place. What we do is we give them a smorgasbord. We give them five sites and say, you tell us which one you like. What effective a couple of weeks ago, we've changed that strategy. We will pick the places where we believe it's best based on our knowledge of what the agency is looking for. We will focus our people on making sure we understand all the issues that exist at that particular site so we can be either begin to ask the state for money with respect to transportation or deal with uh, environmental challenges and what have you so that we can present the best site. I am confident that we will get a, um, a federal building uh, at a transit site within Prince George's County. Uh, we actually have two opportunities to do that. And trust me, we're working actively uh, on that. So once we get all of that done, it produces state and local income taxes, uh, sales taxes, which go to the state, but we can get some of that money back, um, as well as property taxes, amusement and admission taxes, and by, through job creation, income taxes. And then we can re reinvest that. And what then happens is all the wheels are turning. We get more resources. It improves the quality of life in the county and makes you proud to live in Prince George's County and achieves the county executive's mission of making it one of the best places to live, invest, work, and visit. So thank you very much, uh, and I'll stick, stick around to answer questions. What we're going to do, we're going to segment this. We're going to take three or four minutes. If you have specific questions for Brad about county operations, and then we'll let him pack up. He's got other things and family. And then we'll open up questions and comments in terms of me and the, the state and any other issues. So right now, very specific, what Brad covered or didn't cover about county operations. Um, I would also say uh, Danielle Glaros, who works for Eric Olson, whose council district covers about 2 thirds of the 22nd district, does a great deal of work on um, potholes and uncut lawns and lots of things. So in terms of local operations, obviously your local county council member, Eric Olson, is a great resource as well. Anyway, for Brad, yeah, Michael. Um, Brad, um, a little loud, Mike. I noticed in your economic development model you don't address the issue of green jobs. Uh, and I know that, uh, going back to what uh, Paul said about offshore wind turbines, there are companies in Prince George's County who can uh, manufacture these wind turbines that will be used in the offshore initiative. Uh, do you have anything in your uh, plans for green businesses or environmentally supported uh, businesses? Sure, and um, thank you for um, the question, Michael. Um, the only thing that I said in, on here was jobs and not any particular type of job. Um, I think that uh, green jobs are important. Um, we have our economic development incentive fund that we can use to help um, you know, startups, and, and not really startups, but companies that are already operating uh, that may be able to um, produce or retain jobs in the county. Um, and I would certainly consider um, the support for and um, the, the focus on, on green jobs to fall 
within that particular county resource. So while it's not specifically mentioned up here, you asked me if we have any, um, any specific uh, plans or initiatives going in that area. Um, not that I am aware of, but I can, certainly, uh, I can certainly follow up on that. I will say that we do have an economic development plan that is being created right now that is identifying target industries. Uh, Park and Planning is working on that together with some of the county agencies, and that should be, um, that should be released within the next 30 to 60 days. But if you know of one, you should forward yeah. the name of a startup uh, in green, whether sol making solar panels or s installing. They are hungry for any initiatives. Uh, yes. Thank you, and I am taking notes here uh, because I will, as, as, as Paul mentioned, uh, if we don't have the answer, I don't want to give you one that's empty. I'd rather get the real answer for you and follow up uh, through the Senator's office so we can get the information to you. Um, not that I'm aware of, okay? Um, but I will, certainly, I will certainly ask about that. We realize that uh, transportation is important uh, in the county that, um, we try to use the bus system to fill in the gaps where Metro uh, does not run and in directions that Metro is not running in. Um, and we have expanded a couple of lines. I can, get the, um, the, I can get the specific ones for you and if there are any plans and what lines we're talking about expanding in the future. I think that'd be yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your question. Repeat the question. So the question is about um, money for building new or rehabbing elementary schools and what the priorities are. Um, one of the things when I came to the administration, I was not the chief administrative officer, I was a deputy. One of the things that the county executive asked me to do was to chair the school construction committee. So um, for about the first year uh, that I was with the administration, I sat in monthly meetings that um, made sure that, we, that the money that we were getting from the state for construction of new, um, new schools, was, that we wouldn't lose it because it had stalled, it wasn't getting spent. Uh, we made sure that none of it went back. There were a number of, uh, of new schools that were in, um, that were in the plan. Uh, last year's school over here in Greenbelt, uh, in fact, uh, that has opened and some others. I can tell you that right now the, uh, the priority is about rehab uh, and repair of older schools. Um, and the, you know, there's been a, a list that has been pulled together um, and there is a focus there. The schools um, have had some turnover with respect to their uh, project management staff in the CIP area. We have reconstituted the school construction committee meetings. We've had one uh, in the last couple of months, and we have another one upcoming, and we will be focused on uh, those rehabs and, and repairs. There, there, there will be uh, opening in 2014 the new Hyattsville Elementary School behind Nicholas Oram. So there, there, new schools are expensive, as Brad referred to, there are a couple coming on board, but not a lot. Yes, sir. Sure. The way that education fits in is that um, 
North of Grumman, for example, considered uh, moving their headquarters to the county a few years ago um, or, to, or to the state. We lost it to Virginia. Um, one of the questions that the employees will always ask is, where are my kids going to go to school? Okay. Um, they will also ask, is the county safe? Because it doesn't necessarily have the best reputation with respect to public safety. Um, although we've probably always been safer than the District of Columbia, they have just done a better job of, of marketing things. It's really about perception um, and making people want to come, want to move their residents to the county. They have to have some place for their kids to go to school where they don't necessarily want to pay private school tuition. Um, so a real point in answer to your question, that's where it fits in. It fits in in the perception of the county and our ability to attract businesses um, and residents to the county. Now there's a real um, piece of that too and it, it, that is that we want um, the, um, the children in the county to be able to go to college or be prepared to get a job when they come right out of high school. We're currently um, you know, talking about an initiative uh, with the schools that will help in that area. But you know, more healthy behaviors by students and the ability to go to college and get a job and the perception piece. So they, they will be productive members of society um, and we have more people working. We don't have to raise taxes to get more taxes. Uh, and then also the perception of bringing uh, large businesses and other employers into the county. And just briefly, from being in education for 37 years, the key factor is the leadership in the building, the principals. And just as there's been a shortage of teacher shortage over the years, there's been a principal shortage. And the schools across the county are very uneven. Some are working terrifically, some have major problems. And you'll find with a strong, dynamic leadership, they're hiring good teachers and there's a lot of energy. And I think in our district, we have a number of schools that are really on the upswing. You have a lot of uh, good principals. I think when we get a superintendent on board, permanent superintendent, who can start addressing mid-level management, I think we'll see an increase. I think Dr. Height started to do that right before he left, and then he left, and now we have a little, a little stalling. Um, yes, ma'am, and then back here, and then Dan. We're going to take about three or four more, and then let uh, Brad go, and then I'm going to take some broad questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, I appreciate your question. Our, our uh, values of, of uh, property in Prince George's County uh, have gone down significantly over the last couple years. Uh, we're the hardest hit in the state with respect to foreclosures. Uh, in fact, uh, I was on Wall Street yesterday uh, and the day before uh, meeting with the rating agencies there about uh, retaining our AAA bond rating uh, here in the county and they always ask the question about our accessible property tax base. It is the uh, number one source of revenue uh, in the county. I mentioned we have a $2.7 billion budget. Uh, a billion of that comes from the state and then goes to the schools, uh, which leaves um, $1.7 billion, of which the majority of that comes from uh, property taxes and from income taxes. Um, we have a cap on property taxes here in Prince George's County, um, uh, we, but under the name of TRIM, so we cannot actually raise the taxes, uh, the rate of taxes. It does go according to whatever, the, you know, your assessable base is. Um, so while I, um, you know, appreciate your question, you know, it's, it, and, it, and let me say this, that is why we are looking for other revenue sources. I'll be, you know, the Senator mentioned it, you know, one of the reasons why the county executive changed his position with respect to gaming was that we don't want to have to burden the residents in the county um, with, um, you know, more taxes 
Uh, and that is why that $40, billion, $40 million a year, I'm sorry, starting sometime in 2017, will be important to us. Just, just on that, ma'am, in the back there's a, a small brochure, the homeowner relief. Um, there's a number with the state where there's an independent counselor who might offer some advice. It might. Well, the state doesn't have all this money. Yeah. A anyway, right. There's a number that they may be able to give some advice, and there are some banks that are willing to do loan modifications. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. Well. Okay. Well. Right. Well, un unfortunately, there's a. Okay. Okay. And give a card, and we, we can call. Um, uh, Patty, and then we're going to move on. Uh, Patty and Dan, and then we'll take some general questions. Yeah. yeah I'm just speaking as a resident now. Okay. Um, the town of Berkeley Heights is behind on the Manhattan County. Um, we use poor water, you know, tanks. There are a number of residents in Berkeley Heights that have poor water drains, including me in the backyard. And I'm just wondering how the county's going to uh, handle that. Yeah, I'm not sure Brad's going to have the answer to that. He can. Yeah, I can talk, but not, ha and I can get it. But I, let me just simply say that um, I will follow up with um, our Department of Environmental Resources and our Department of Transportation, and I will uh, get some information uh, with respect to Berwyn Heights and the surrounding areas about the stormwater uh, management. Dan, uh, Dan, and then we'll just open it up. Right, and I totally agree with you that leverage is the name of the game. I mean, as one thing's happening, we can get other things to happen at the same time. Um, I, your comments with respect to uh, the location of the hospital, um, we need to have some public input on that, and we will be uh, in the first couple of months of uh, next year. We're going to have to have um, a site selected for that. Um, by the spring or so in order to get a certificate of need uh, into the state by the fall to have a groundbreaking in 2014. The, uh, the discussion about an urban model for a hospital at a transit site um, is a vigorous conversation that is happening. Um, the problem with, with the urban design um, is that it's more vertical than sprawling, and vertical costs more money. So I'm not saying that that won't happen, I'm just saying that one of the challenges with having a vertical design uh, on the hospital, on the regional medical center, uh, is, is cost. With respect to um, the siting of uh, the resort facility, uh, hopefully at National Harbor, 
Um, there are discussions as well um, about you know, the need for transportation across the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Um, we certainly will not be doing things that will get in the way of, of being able to, to do that because that really cuts off the number of people um, that, that will come uh, to the casino from the best place, and that is out of the state of Maryland. So um, you know, we, those, those are certainly things that, that are being talked about, things that are being considered, and um, I can only assure you that we're working actively to come up with the best solution. The last thing I'll say is most of the success that we've had in the administration so far has been around collaboration. We get together, we coalesce around a particular um, uh, project, site, or whatever, and that is what we hope to be able to do with respect to the siting of the uh, regional medical center as well. Okay, uh, it's 11, and I said I'd value your time. We're, we started a little bit late, so we're going to take questions for about eight or nine minutes, and then we're going to end it, and I'm going to hang around. So very short, succinct questions, and I promise we'll have short, succinct answers. Um, uh, one, two, three. Yeah, um, unfortunately, geothermal, for example, is a lot easier when you're actually starting to build something. It, before there, it, rather than retrofit. I mean, you have to go through a yard. It depends on the size of your yard. I think uh, there's some cost efficiency questions of size. Um, for, unfortunately, for it, the most efficient for a residential house is energy efficiency, is fixing up your windows, uh, programmable thermostat. You could probably save more money uh, by having an energy audit and making some changes, insulation, windows, um, than you could by adding solar panels or numbers of things. Unfortunately, there are some state and federal credits, but because the upfront cost is so high, it's very difficult for an individual home. But we'd be happy to talk to you about that, and you can call Ian in our office, and he can give us some suggestions. Bill. Maybe too soon, uh, since the suggestion was made to him recently that he should look into the losses to the county uh, from uh, commercial property tax abatements that occur throughout the county, both incorporated and unincorporated areas. This is a state question as well. It affects municipalities which have to give back money to commercial property owners who request and receive abatements. It affects the county in unincorporated parts of the county. It goes on through the state, so it, state, it affects state revenues. Uh, certainly, I'd like to see the legislature take it up. I'd like to see county government take it up. Uh, we, uh, as individual homeowners, wouldn't have to have as high a property tax as we do have if the commercial property owners uh, had a more significant property tax. They're in the business of owning property to make a profit. They make a profit, they make a very good profit, and don't pay, as I would argue, and maybe others would argue, they should, based on the profit they make. But when they, make, when they don't make as much profit as they want, they ask for abatements, and when they receive abatements, it's necessary that the, what falls short of collection from them uh, goes to the individual property owner and your residential assessment goes up. Okay. It's unfair to residences who own, re residents of the county and the state who own property that the commercial property owners get away uh, with asking and receiving almost at will abatements when they are misusing their property and making us pay for their mistake. Duly noted. Thank you. Um, uh, yes.
into other areas of the county, of the state. Why don't other states do the, uh, their problem send it down to us? Because we, we give them a majority of our gaming money to those other areas. All right? <coughs> so what's, what's the problem with other counties funding our my understanding, and Brad, can, if he comes back, can, can fill in, the existing gaming sites, there's one in Anne Arundel County, there's one on the Eastern Shore, there's one up in Cecil County. Um, and I don't have the exact percent. It is split between the state, not the counties, it's split between the state and the uh, license holder. So most of that money goes to the state, to the state budget. It doesn't go back to Worcester County or um, Anne Arundel County, they get like 2% or 4% for infrastructure, roads or whatever they need in that immediate area, but most of it goes to the state. The same is going to be true here, okay? But I think the amusement tax and any spinoff, I think they believe the $40 million will be on infrastructure, uh, amusement tax, but the, but the basic dollars that are spent don't go to the local jurisdiction, it goes to the state with some support to the local, but most of it goes to the state. So we are indirectly getting money from Anne Arundel County uh, and the, from the three facilities. We are not getting directly. We are not. Nobody, no county is getting the money directly. So in other words, if, if they bring in $5 million a month in Anne Arundel County, Anne Arundel County doesn't get 20% of that money or 40%. Um, do you know the split? It's like 37% goes to the uh, uh, license holder and I think 53% or whatever goes to the state. The county does not get a direct cut. They get some initial money when they fix the roads around it and they might get another percent or two, but then the money goes to the state and that could be used for Medicaid or education. So then the jurisdictions will get that money accordingly, but not specifically that jurisdiction. Okay, we have a bunch of questions, but uh, let's, sure. The, I'm sorry. The which is the health care uh, uh, zone. Okay. Okay. Uh, some primary care physicians and, and uh, health care in general physicians uh, no longer accept some affordable HMO plans in the county. And those plans are accessible in neighboring counties. So what are we doing, what is the county doing to I'm going to pull you in, Brad. Uh, I think the question is some physicians and some groups are not accepting some, some HMOs. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we have, you know, we have 25,000 people that leave the county and go predominantly to the district every year to be admitted in hospitals. Um, one of the things, you know, with health care reform, um, and we have health benefit exchange that will come online, uh, state sponsored, and it'll come online in the fall of next year for more, you know, affordable uh, health insurance plans and also access to public assistance programs. We need to expand the number of federally qualified health centers that we have in the county because the federally qualified health centers will accept uh, a lot of the forms of insurance that uh, private physicians will not. Um, and so we are actively working on that. But that's really where we need some expansion is in those federally qualified health centers. And we're working right now um, in uh, Suitland. And as part of the plan with the regional medical center, um, the plan is to actually have a primary care site at um, the Gladys Noon Spellman building 
uh, in Chevrolet as well. So that is really the, the answer to that, and we're actively working on that. And, and, and I think just a, a fine point to it. Obviously, you can't require a physician to, to take someone's insurance, but with the health exchanges, hopefully it'll direct people and the market will put pressure on those folks who don't choose to do it. But unfortunately, if they don't want to take United Health or, or uh, um, Kaiser, they can't be forced to, unfortunately or unfortunately. Um, we're going to take about three more uh, here, 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 and I'm sorry, ma'am, and you. We're going to take those four, then we'll hang around afterwards. Yes? Brad? Aging services in the county, well, I understand the county and the state don't have money to really enhance aging services for that period. Right. However, as were aging in place, we need to develop models similar to what's called the village concept that Bradfield started. Some of us in the Lincoln Park want to do these throughout the city or district. Ideas of trying to get at least elected official support for a voluntary system or a small cost. Yeah, what he's referring to, Hyattsville just started. They are starting a voluntary program. They just got a grant to um, coordinate volunteers with people who need support and assistance and would like to remain in their home. I don't want to say it's outside the system, but it's a community-based aging in place with your neighbors of different ages. And I think the grant is going to be used to coordinate, to, to get it jump-started with the idea of without having to go through all the social service agencies, there's a neighborhood coordination with people who will come in, give you support, offering support, a high school just starting it. Or, or as well as just that individual coordinating will actually get you connected to the support service centers that are available. Right, so uh, obviously it would, ben it would be a benefit to the county and the state to buy into it. Yes, um, here, here, and here. The, stu the preliminary steps of a study are being undertaken. To do it fully, it's fairly expensive. And there was a bill last year or the year before saying that the company that wants the fracking, before it's even considered, they've got to contribute as a fee to underwrite the cost of the complete study. Um, that has not happened yet, so it's limping along, I think is the best way to put it. I don't think we're anywhere close to having a fully completed study with legitimate uh, f scientific fidelity that is an objective study yet. So the state has not put any little, the state's put little money. They've used whatever is in the Department of the Environment and Department of Natural Resources to sort of do the underpinnings and the beginnings of it. Um, I believe and I am joining those in environmental organizations that say we should fully fund a significant study and do nothing until that comes back. So the governor is on board of saying, I'm going to wait on this. So whether the study gets done or not, now he's in, in place for another two years. Will that be part of the legislature then this session to get funding for this study? Um, there are a couple variations. I know of at least two bills that have been put in. One is to say there should be a moratorium and that should only be uh, lifted with a, a vote by the leg legislature in ensuing years. There's another bill that's an outright ban, period, end of discussion. So the answer is I'm not sure if it's going to say explicitly about the study and the funding. Although one of the bills will say until we have data on these six or eight or 13 data points, we shouldn't proceed. So it will be an issue during the general. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Dwayne and then this woman over here. I assume you're talking about the ICC, uh, no, particularly? No, the easy pass, they say people are flying through them without passes and not paying, and the state does not have the authority to yank the license of these millions of dollars that are reported in the post, and the, uh, I don't, I don't yeah. see any progress collecting that money, and was it used for this highway uh, user fund shortage, so. 
Um, I always assumed they had the authority to collect that money. Now, I, I've heard that question coming up in recent weeks. Um, and I heard more specifically about the ICC, because there's, there's no cash on the ICC. You use a transponder. If you don't have a transponder, they shoot a picture, but they're not collecting that back money. I don't have a definite answer. We'll check into it. Yes, ma'am. Here, let me give you my card. Um, like I told you, we have our uh, economic development incentive fund. We can't help everybody, but we can listen to most people. So what you should do is contact, contact my office, OK? OK, I, I know people have to, I'm going to stay around. Brad may be able to stay around a few minutes. Laverna, I will answer your question. Um, look, I want to thank everyone for taking time on a Saturday morning. I hope you have a, ha a happy holiday, a safe and happy holiday. Uh, we are always available. If you have a question, we'll find out an answer for you. You might like it, you might not like it, but we're, we try to be straight shooters and not mislead you or just pacify you. Um, but if on the state level, call myself or the three delegates on a, a council level, Eric Olson or uh, Peggy Higgins or whoever the school board or county council member. Again, it's Ian, Ian Ullman and Kim Taylor who's over here. Um, we will be around, don't forget, January 21st. There's a little postcard if you want uh, to know who to RSVP to for our reception in Annapolis. You'll get a feel for the place. Um, I want to thank the, the mayor and the council of Riverdale Park for allowing us to use the school and supporting us in everything they do. So uh, with that, thank you. Drive safely, and I'm staying around. Thank you.